Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the FCC, uh, some misconceptions that people in our industry have. Uh, the first thing I want to say before I get started, and I want you all to view everything through this lens, don't panic. The FCC does not have a bunch of black clad ninja engineers out there kicking in doors and looking for people to arrest. But as open source hardware grows in size and prominence, this is something that we all need to start being aware of and we need to take into account as we bring more products to market. Um, the next thing I want to point out is that I am only going to talk about the FCC, which means only about rules for the United States. Uh, the EU, China, Canada, not the 51st state, contrary to some people's opinions, uh, Brazil, and Russia, Japan, you get the idea. These guys all have different rules, different things that you have to do, different sets of tests that you have to run before you can sell products in those country, countries. Some of them are a little catchier than others about what they'll sell and what their rules are. Some of them have uh, reciprocal agreements allowing testing in one country to be accepted in another. Uh, but for today, only gonna talk about the FCC. Uh, if you only remember one word from this presentation, I want it to be authorization. It's a crap word for the concept that we're talking about here because it makes it sound like you actually have to have somebody that tells you, yes, your device is authorized. That's not always the case, and I'll touch on that a little bit. But before most electronic devices can be sold in the United States, they require some form of authorization from the FCC in order to be legal. Um, to better illustrate how that affects us as a group, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the myths that I've heard um, as I've been going over this for the last couple of years. The first one, and by far the most common, is my product is a development tool, so it's exempt from the FCC rules. I'm going to say this very clearly. There's not an exemption for development tools. Uh, that is not a thing. Uh, the exemption list is really short. Basically, uh, things for use in transportation vehicles, public utilities, uh, industrial, commercial, or medical test equipment, appliances, things like uh, washer dryer, stuff like that. Um, what's useful as a loophole, not a loophole, but an actual exemption for us, is devices using less than six nanowatts. Um, so I think some people here know how hard that is to develop. Um, and then the other really useful one is de devices operating at a frequency below 1.705 megahertz. I don't know where that number came from. And operating on batteries only. Also, uh, sub-assemblies, uh, so like stuff, um, a lot of you are probably familiar with smartphone products, things like a breakout board that is just a circuit board that has a, an accelerometer on it. That is a sub-assembly. FCC doesn't care about that. Their point uh, is that that will be tested when somebody builds it into a final product. Uh, the other thing is uh, things developed for home use, not intended for sale. Uh, so long as you use good engineering practice, whatever that means, their term, not mine, um, and you don't build more than five for personal consumption, knock yourself out. Um, the next one, it, the idea that I'm not using radio, uh, for instance, like a radio control device or something like that, so there's nothing I need to worry about. Um, or it's closed because then I'm using an authorized module, for instance, an XB, that's kind of the, the gold standard these days. Um, so I don't need to worry about it. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, pretty much anything that uses digital electronics, again, above that 1.705 megahertz magic number, um, the FCC cares about those devices. Uh, you've seen these labels. Uh, many of these things look a little familiar. Uh, these things are indicators that the device in question, either the device that the manual that you're currently reading refers to, or the, uh, the device with the label actually on it, has been tested to comply with the limits set forth by the FCC to ensure that it's not going to cause uh, trouble for other devices. Um, the next, whoops, next myth, we are too small of an outfit to need to worry about this. Uh, I, the, essentially the FCC will never notice us. Um, earlier this year, the FCC actually fined a retiree who was assembling low power AM transmitter kits. 
Now he's buying the kits from somebody else and assembling them and then selling them to people who couldn't pick up a soldering iron on their own. Um, and they fined him for doing this and they shut him down. Um, back in 2006, an FC, I like this, this is one of my favorites. An FCC agent found an improperly labeled novelty FM radio at the Seattle Space Needle gift shop. And the importer of that radio from China ended up paying $7,000 for that infraction. I love the thought of like, you know, guy on vacation, checking the bottom of this radio, and oh, it doesn't have the right sticker. Um, so even fairly small and fairly niche products, all it takes is you gotta fall under the wrong person's attention at the wrong time. Um, the other one that I hear is we can't afford it, so why worry about it? Um, and this one, uh, this, is, this is one that really bothers me. I see people, um, talking about this online in their forums and they'll, somebody will pose the question, well, you know, what, is, uh, what do I need to do to make sure this is, is acceptable? And somebody else will say, well, you have to go to such and such a lab and you have to pay them X thousand dollars, X usually being somewhere between 20 and 40. Uh, the fact is that for unintentional radiators, um, I've found that a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars is usually the, the range that it costs. If you use an uh, approved module, something like an XP, you can stay in that unintentional radiator category and you don't have to redo the intentional radiator testing, so it keeps your costs down. If you really want to go whole hog, get yourself an FCC ID, the whole nine yards, knock yourself out, that's going to run you about ten or twelve grand. But that's still less than the forty or fifty thousand, you know, whatever that, that is floating around on the internet. And the last thing that I hear, um, people get, you know, they get cunning and they think they're going to be devious, and they'll say, "I'll just make it a kit, and that'll fix everything." Uh, but the FCC regulations specifically address kits, even the devious buggers, even kits where not all of the parts are included in the kit. Um, they require that you assemble the kits and do some testing of the assembled kits to ensure that they are going to meet the category of product that you intend to sell them. Um, so uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. Give me an email, mike.word at SparkFun. I'll be wandering around for the rest of the evening. Start looking for me at the SparkFun booth and uh, I'll try and answer any questions that you have. I know a few of you probably have some. So, thank you very much.